Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on the latest edition of The Pulse with BP. I'm your host, Billy Parbatam. Thank you again for joining us on our latest episode. No disrespect, folks, to all of my previous guests, but I think it's safe to say our uh, next guest is probably the biggest name we've uh, been able to have come on our show, and I can't thank him enough for his time. It's none other than Anish Sharaf, a longtime ESPN broadcaster, has been there since 2008. A jack of all trades can do lacrosse, which I think is, you know, he's Mr. Lacrosse yeah, uh, when it comes to that sport. He's done college sports, Little League World Series. Anish, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, glad to be here. So uh, let me, I guess, start with uh, a basic question. But when did you know you wanted to uh, become a sports broadcaster? Uh, probably when uh, I figured I wasn't going to be the center fielder for the Yankees. So, um, <laughs> I mean, in some ways, I've probably known since, you know, I was 10, 11 years old. But um, I think really once I got into middle school and especially high school, um, I would probably say by my freshman year in high school, I had a pretty clear idea of what I wanted to do. And uh, I, I told Denise this and kind of preparing for this interview that I didn't want this to be the standard. How'd you get from point A to point B in your career? I wanted to dive deeper into sort of um, – the, the dynamic that helped him sort of or has kind of surrounded him his whole life, uh, you know, becoming a sports broadcaster. And I guess uh, needless to say, uh, let's kind of get the elephant out of the room. But uh, Anish, as you know, quite frankly, is not as many people that look like you in the sports broadcasting business, certainly better now than I'm sure it was uh, when you were growing up. But did that ever dawn on you when you were growing up, you know, realizing that you wanted to be a sports broadcaster, being an Indian American, that there wasn't a lot of people in the business that looked like you? No, and it probably should have, but if it did, I'm not sure I'd be sitting here, to be, to be quite honest. Um, I was really fortunate where, you know, in South Asian communities and Indian communities, a lot of times the pushback that you have is somebody wants to follow your dreams in a path that's non-traditional is you get pushed back from your parents. And I was really fortunate in that, um, you know, there was no parental pressure to be something I didn't want to be. And, you know, my father has a degree in accounting and he's a professional photographer and he's been a photographer um, his whole life and he had a business. He's now retired. And, you know, my mom was very creative and liked to read and write and kind of came from a self-made family. So both of them said, you know, find what you love, do what you love. And if you're willing to work hard for it, that, that's more than enough. And so I got a lot of encouragement and it was never, ever really brought up to me that, Hey, there's nobody else doing this that looks like you. And so in my mind, I just kind of figured, okay, like I didn't really, didn't really have that in the back of my mind um, growing up. Now, like once I got to college and you kind of look around in your classes, you know, it sort of dawns on you that you're the only one. Um, and there were things that happened kind of later in my career that sort of made you realize, okay, you know, um, this could, have its challenges but um, no growing up um, you know that idea that hey there's nobody on tv that looked like me that that never dawned on me you did mention though in a july 2017 ted talk that you did which is by the way called the power of being undefined i highly recommend you go watch it it's on youtube that you did have friends that you know when you were growing up and telling them that you wanted to become a sports broadcaster they would say you know this is not what we do if you want to do that you're not indian enough you're acting white uh, do, you, do you remember a specific instance where that happened or was it kind of all throughout your childhood when you realized yeah, there, you wanted to become there were a lot? Like, I mean, that, that was the thing. The good thing is I had good parents, right? So my parents never always told me, Hey, don't listen to that stuff, you know, work hard, be successful. Um, and, and if you're able to do this, you will, but no, I did get that from members of my community. Got that in high school, um, you know, where, you know, like you don't like math and science. Like, no, I don't, I like, didn't like math and science. I liked English and history. That was my thing. I would win essay contests. So, um, but that idea that that would define my ethnicity and who I am, I always thought was kind of ludicrous. Like, you know, here we are trying to break stereotypes and you're basically accusing me of not being a stereotype. <laughs> I always just kind of met at a very young age, found the hypocrisy in that. So, um, you know, that motivated me more of anything. Like, you know, why do I have to fit into a box? Why can't I be an individual? Like, I'm very comfortable with my identity and who I am and my ethnic, my cultural identity. Um, but that doesn't mean I need to, like, check off every box that fits um, what you think is a member of your group. Um, to me, if I go outside of that and, and, and I'm able to be successful and be something, I think I'm opening doors for a lot of other people. So, 
you know, did I think of that stuff back then? No, but in, but in hindsight, you know, I'm glad those people, while they said it, it, it didn't really, it didn't really get to me. What I think did frustrate me at least early in my career when I had a little bit of success was, you know, the same people who were then showing up and telling you, well, now you represent. And, <laughs> you know, I think part of the struggle in, in our community and our ethnic group when people want to branch out into the arts or media or TV is, yeah, like everybody represents once they get to the finish line. We just have to be more supportive when they say, hey, I want to run this, run this race or, I don't know if I can do it and I need some encouragement. Like that's when you need the support, you need the encouragement. When you get to the end, like, yeah, everybody shows up, but it's kind of like, where, where were you where I really needed it? <laughs> um, do you still struggle with that now? I mean, I'm sure I'm not the only per Indian American that has reached out to you saying, you know, you're a role model for our community. Do you still struggle <laughs> with that or how, has it gotten better since you've, you know, been more involved with ESPN? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, I think I think it's, uh, you know, like, it's definitely gotten better. I, I don't really struggle with it as much anymore. I think the struggle now is almost a sense of, uh, of empathy and sympathy for, you know, some of the guys like, you know, in your shoes and not you individually, but others like you who say, hey, I really want to do this, but my parents won't let me. And, you know, they tell me I can't. And I can't tell you how many parents I've had to talk to and say, well, why aren't you allowing your kid to live this American dream like you left everything in your home country you immigrated here you built a life I get it you think uh, career in medicine or engineering or law or business is going to be more lucrative probably initially um, and yeah there's a lot of hard days early in your media career where you don't make a lot of money but um, I said you know you, you guys came here to to live out your dream now that you're here why won't you let your child live out their dream why do they have to live out your dream and um, parents have a lot, have a lot of difficulty kind of letting go. I think you'll see that change with the next generation, like my generation and your generation. Once our kids grow up, you know, we're not going to force them to be something they don't want to be. And um, so, yeah, like I, I, that's where the struggle is now. Like I still wish like parents could kind of see the bigger picture, but um, you know, that's not, that's not germane to just our immigrant community and our immigrant experience. It, it's germane to a lot of immigrant experiences. A lot of them, though, are just further down the road in terms of generation. So I do think we'll get there. But uh, that, that, that's probably the biggest thing. How, how have those conversations been? Have you been able to you know, change some minds? Have they been positive conversations? You know, I would say it's been a mixed bag. I think some where you, you get off the phone, you think I really changed their mind, and then you get an email from the kid a couple of weeks later and say, hey, man, really appreciate you talking to my parents, but, uh, you know, they said they wouldn't financially back me or they would cut me off if I went and did this, so I'm going to law school or I'm going to get my MBA. And, um, you know, it's kind of like you don't want that. I mean, there, there's a – I always tell people there's a story of a, a family friend who uh, their parents would always really brag about, um, you know, how their son – went to med school and he you know went to an ivy league college and then went to med school and then after med school he told his parents listen uh, i you know went through all this because you guys wanted me to do this and i did this for you but um i really want to be in business and he went and got his mba and the parents would always brag about that story yeah you know my son did eight years of med school just to just to show us he could be a doctor and i'm like how is that a badge of honor you, you forced him to waste eight years of his life doing something he didn't want to do. And where was the gumption on his end to kind of stand up for what he believed in? But, you know, we're still in a culture and society where rebelling against your parents is not as popular as it is in American culture. And, um, you know, the, the, the parental umbrella is cast pretty wide. Despite that, I mean, we have you and Kevin Nagandi and Adam Amin and Adnan Virk and other, other figures in sports broadcasting in the news. We've got Manu Raju Entertainment, Asam Minaj, and a host of other names. So do you think that we have, uh, are changing the culture for the better, or is it still a mixed bag? Yeah, I mean, listen, none of those guys were on TV when I was growing up, and that's been pretty cool to see. And, you know, there's Sanjay Gupta, who was pretty much the only one back in the day. And, you know, you see Mindy Kaling, and you're seeing Slumdog Millionaire win Best Picture. So our culture is starting to infiltrate the mainstream um you know kevin and adam and adnan and, and you know there's a few others dari and, and, and zubin and nabil you know like we all talk and 
um, you know, we had a Zoom chat a few months ago. And, you know, I think part of our next challenge now is to kind of represent our culture uh, a little more. I think part of the reason we got in was, you know, there's a little bit of that model minority myth that, that probably is real. And it's, hey, they put their head down, they work, they don't make waves. Um, you know, they, they, they put in the effort, uh, they're hardworking folks. But in terms of actually bringing forth our culture on the air, the way maybe um, a black anchor or a black broadcaster or Hispanic broadcaster could, I don't think we really do that. Like, you don't see us dropping tikka masala references on the air, you know? <laughs> um, and, and I've thought about that and I said, like, why not, right? And so I, I think that's kind of the next challenge now that we have this platform and maybe we have a, a degree of safety and comfort in, in our jobs okay, let's kind of show people who we are and where we're from and um, be a voice that can bring some of our culture into the mainstream because that's what America is. I mean, shoot, like pizza is not American food. Burritos are not American food, but we view them as wholly American because those cultures have became, uh, you know, part of this quilt. So I think now it's for us to do a little bit of that too. You know, you've been at ESPN for 12 years, as I mentioned. Do you still face stereotypes, whether it's, you know, places you go or people you work with? Or, you know, being that you've established yourself for well over a decade, have those kind of faded out? Yeah, they're probably not as overt anymore. But I think on a subtle level, you know, I still see it. Um, I remember I was doing a football game um, at Iowa State a few years ago. And, um, you know, I had it like it took basically every fiber in my body not to say something. And, you know, there's kind of a little area where you're collecting your game notes and stuff. And I hear these two middle-aged um, – white sports, you know, I don't know, sports writer, I don't know what they were, but they were kind of standing behind a podium and one of them was laughing. Hey, did you, did you see that there's a guy named Anish and Ahmad doing the game for ESPN? And they started laughing like it was some kind of novelty act. And, um, you know, I kind of wanted to say something, but there was hardly anybody in the press room at the time. And it was me and it was two of them. And I like, you know, I'm going to get worked up before the game. So I just kind of went in um, to the booth counted to 10 and, and, you know, took it from there. But, you know, there's things like that. I applied for a job. This was way before ESPN. And I remembered I got a call from the sports director and he called me directly. And this was a medium sized market in the Midwest. He said, Hey, I really like your tape. I'm like, Oh, it's great. He's like, yeah, like we think you've got the best tape. And I was like, Oh, cool. Like I have a chance to make, you know, 40, 50 market jump here. He's like, the only issue is like, we have somebody else with an ethnic name already in our sports department. And I was like, so? He's like, yeah, listen, I want to hire you, but our news director doesn't think it would make sense in our market to have two ethnic names in our in one sports department. I was kind of like, huh. And I look back on that, and I was like, I should have been more upset. But I kind of accepted that as, okay, like that's just the norm in this business. You know, like that's the stuff we have to go through. And then I found myself refreshing their website for like, 60 days afterwards to see who they ended up hiring and it was a guy with like a generic white guy name and I looked at their website and I was like well they've got two generic white guy names in their sports department like is that okay and I had this email ready to go to their news director but I never hit send on it uh, because you know sometimes that stuff can follow you and, and you can get blackballed and whatnot so I, I decided to hold off but um, I think we have accepted that there's going to be these subtle slings and arrows. And uh, like I said, maybe not as many overt things anymore, but I think now, you know, given the current cultural climate, I think we feel a little empowered to fight those probably more so than ever. Uh, but those little slings and arrows, man, they, they, they do add up. And I think we take a lot of them for granted. I had a professor in college tell me, um, you know, if you want to be in this business and be on TV, you need to change your name. And I said, well, my name's part of my identity. I don't want to do that. He goes, no one's going to hire you with that name. And I thought of that when I didn't get the job, you know, um, in that market, um, in that mid-sized market of the Midwest. And so, um, you know, I think, again, those little things where how much of you do you have to sacrifice and check and almost mold um, to fit into a culture that's not yours um, and to fit into a patriarchy that really isn't yours. I mean, it's almost a form of colonialism. So, you know, I think all those things, all those things definitely, definitely come into play. How do we solve some of the other structural problems that are in sort of the broadcast industry? I mean, I know your friend, Mike Cousins, he had a great thread the other day talking about 
you know, uh, the internships that are available when you're in college. And quite frankly, they don't pay much, if at all. I mean, I remember my three summers in college, the three internships I did one year, I didn't get paid the last two summers. You know, I've got paid two grand. I, I wasn't able to make it if not for the financial support of my parents. Do you think that is a problem as well? And if so, how do we solve that? I think it's somewhat of a problem. I don't think it's the problem. I think at the end of the day, you know, people like to hire people who look like them in large part. And so, you know, I think the article that you referenced, there was something about uh, 130 collegiate jobs, right, um, in college football. And, and, you know, what, two people of color as the main voices for those jobs. You know, I mean, I can't say I'm surprised. I mean, at the end of the day, I think there, there's, there's two sides of it. One, I think we as minorities need to take a little bit more ownership in supporting our own. Um, I think we can do a better job of that. Like, I think first we have to say, what is it that we can do? What, what can we do? You know, um, Indian Americans don't always encourage their children to pursue the arts and pursue careers in journalism and, and, and media, as we mentioned earlier, music, or TV, whatever. So I think we have to kind of be um, a little bit more progressive in terms of letting our kids chase their dreams. And then I think the second part is, you know, we have to find a way to, to, to get some of us in the leadership roles. Um, and, you know, we need to kind of start knocking on doors to say, hey, like, what about leadership programs and, and training, um, you know, minorities and people of color to be news directors and to be executive producers and, you know, to, to kind of have some responsibility and to have some teams instead of being on that, you know, worker bee level. And I think once you have that, it'll change. And so, you know, you, you go back and always like look at it. Sometimes it's not that complicated. You know, the people that hire, for the most part, they want people who look and align with them. And so if you're a minority, as we said before, you have to kind of present yourself in a way, in a package that is amenable to something that you think they would want. And, um, you know, I think at some point now, we're at the point now where I think you can be you uh, probably a little bit more than you could have um, depending on where you come from. So I think that more than anything is the biggest thing because, you know, you're also then assuming like, okay, are all minorities poor? No, they're not all poor, um, you know? So, uh, you know, some of them, I mean, Indian Americans, if you look at the numbers, um, uh, have the highest per capita income, um, have, have the highest household income of any ethnic group, including whites in the United States. I think it's the only ethnic group that as a household makes more than a hundred thousand dollars a year. So to say, Hey, why aren't there enough Indian Americans doing this? You know, I don't think you can say it because they're not having the financial support, right? Like in large part, they do like their parents are well off. Um, so, you know, I think there's different parts of it. I think maybe in some communities that's more true than others, but, um, I, you know, it's layered. I mean, I don't think we encourage them enough and, and I don't think they, you know, I think we got to do a better job being role models to them and finding role models to them for them and finding, uh, role models and leadership for them and people who will mentor. I mean, those things are all, are all important. You know, I think it's more than just kind of the cost of uh, attendance, if you will, for an internship. And I mean, and you know this well, I mean, you went to Yakima, Washington, you've been all over the country to sort of build up to the dream that you've always had. Uh, you know, our, this industry, it's not one of those industries like maybe engineering or the medical field where you get out of school, you're making six figures. I mean, you really do, as you know, well, have to work yourself up. And I think a lot of times that's kind of what, um, adds to sort of the, the problems and trying to fix the stereotype as well, don't you think? Yeah. I mean, listen, my first job paid 20000 and 22000 on a two-year contract. I mean, um, it just is baffling at this point. Like, I mean, I can't believe I worked for that much. I can't believe I afforded, um, you know, an apartment and a cable bill and all those things, making that much money and then was able to go out to drink and go out to eat. So, yeah, I mean, that's part of it. I think parents sometimes of immigrants don't want to see their kids struggle. So, you know, they don't see the end game where, hey, if you're able to move up, this can be a very lucrative endeavor at a certain point. Um, so they don't want to have that struggle. But, um, you know, that is that is part of the grind. And the reason for that is there's a lot of people who want to do it. And, you know, you, you'll probably get more tapes in Yakima than you will in Market 10 because everyone's trying to apply for those jobs. And we would have, I mean, I remember like this giant cardboard box, it was a hundred tapes for a reporter opening that paid $18,000 a year. I mean, you know, it's a hard job to get. And then the other part of that is too, you know, connections are so big in this business. I didn't know anybody, um, really. The only person that I knew 
when I was going to college was Sagar Magani, who's uh, an AP news reporter now and was doing, I think, AP radio at the time. And he was a Syracuse guy and a friend of one of my uncles and who had gone to law school in Syracuse with him. And he put me on the phone with Sagar before I uh, went to Syracuse and when I was looking at schools and he talked to me for a little bit and was like, hey, you need to, you know, they've got this program here at WAER. And so that was like the only guy I really knew. And then you know, I was trying to build up my network while I was at, at school. But, like, I remember going in there and one of the kids there was like, yeah, yeah, my dad's like a lawyer and his client's Jesse Jackson, you know. And, like, they had all these connections. Um, so many of these people that I w- was in, in school with. And, like, man, I don't know anybody. <laughs> Did you ever let uh, – because I'm sure your career hasn't been just a smooth road. There have been time, bumpy roads and, and bumpy places along the way. Did you ever let that criticism get to you? And, and how did you, you know, find a way to sort of combat that and, and get out of that funk? What do you mean? What criticism? And just in terms of, you know, you're, you're working in, in Yakima, Washington, and, um, you know, probably working long hours. Did, did you, you know, those days where it was hard, did you kind of hear those, those criticisms of, you know, you can't do this, there's no one out there like you, and, um, or was that never really part of the equation? You don't know. I mean, I, I will say from my peers, I mean, even going back to college, I think, uh, you know, and I don't say this to, to try to, to brag or anything, but I always got the sense that I belonged and my work was valued. Um, you know, when I was in school, I was the sports director of my college radio station. Um, I think I'd proven myself and we had a lot of other talented people. I mean, you know, I went to school with, like Jason Benetti and then, you know, so a lot of guys who I thought were really, really good. And I always felt I could hold my own. And uh, that was never an issue. And then even when I started working in Yakima, like I never felt that my work didn't hold up. I mean, I took a lot of pride in my work. Um, I think the one mentality that we're sort of trained with um, in our culture um, is this idea that it's not an uneven, it's not an even playing field. So, I mean, my mom told me growing up, you're going to have to work harder than the average kid. Like, you can't be successful and average as a brown man in America. You might be able to be successful and average as a white man in America, but as a brown man in America, you're going to have to work harder. And so that was always ingrained in me. So it was like, all right, like putting in the long hours and not having to put in overtime because, you know, they wouldn't pay you. Fine, I'll do it because I'm trying to get to the next level. So I never really cared about you know oh well I'm putting in these long hours can I do it now I did have a moment of truth when I left Yakima my job was actually uh, cut and so I was doing news there for a while and applied to some other jobs and I ended up at a sports documentary company in New York for about a half second and after about a day I realized that this which was a startup was not going to work needed to get out of there, started applying to some jobs. And it was in that time I, I did have a moment of truth. I said, you know what, like if I can't get something soon, maybe I'll go to law school. I can, I can talk, I can argue. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I did have that little bit of doubt, you know, I was probably what, 24 years old, 25 years old. And I was really wondering if this was for me and ended up getting a job back in Syracuse and probably, I would say, 10 months after that moment of death, I ended up being uh, hired at ESPN. So um, things ended up working out. I was only in Syracuse for six months. But, yeah, I did have that moment of doubt kind of in between when things were uh, up in the air. You know, I had to move back home with my dad. And <laughs> it was, uh, you know, shoot, man, we're, we're midlife, a quarter-life crisis, I guess you could say. You know, and you've mentioned, uh, you know, a bunch of times, a couple of times now that, you know, you feel like you have a platform now to, to really speak out, you know, given your stature. Um, and, I, and I followed your, your social media accounts. I mean, you're never shy about, you know, speaking on, on what's going on. How do you navigate that balance? Because I'm sure uh, and it's not just for you. I mean, athletes, anyone involved in sports, people see them as only uh, they should only stick to sports. But so how do you kind of navigate all those boundaries and obstacles and, you know, Twitter, the Twitter sphere and, and social media sphere? Yeah, I mean. Zero bleeps is probably a good way to put it. Um, when people say stick to sports, it's like, okay, like if you work in finance, then does that give you a right to have an opinion on sports? Does that give you a right to have an opinion on politics? Of course it does. So for somebody like me who works in sports, yeah, I, I follow politics and the news cycle and I follow history and I follow pop culture. And, you know, I feel that I've, had a pretty good liberal arts education. So 
um, you know, I'm knowledgeable on some of that stuff. Um, and so to just paint me as just a sports guy, you know, you're basically saying, well, when you talk about something else that makes me uncomfortable, well, so be it. Um, you can unfollow, you can block, you can mute, you have options. You know, nobody's telling you to listen to what I have to say. Um, but I, I don't see myself as only a sports guy. I never have. And, you know, I mean, I, you know, I'm always reading a book. And like I said, I would say probably 80 to 90% of them have nothing to do with sports. Um, I like to educate myself on topics that I'm unfamiliar with, things I want to know more about. I, and so a lot of it is uh, historical and, and political and, and, and other things. And, you know, I've kind of always been the detour becomes the destination. People say, well, you know, what do you see yourself doing in 10 years? I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to be doing in five years. Maybe it's the same thing. Maybe it's something else. But, um, you know, I've always loved to learn. And I always feel the, you know, we're in a spot now where everybody has this really hardened worldview. And they're unwilling to accept anything outside of that box, even if it's fact. And there's a lot of truths, man, that, that are unpleasant and inconvenient but they're still true. <laughs> and, and just because you don't like them doesn't make them untrue. And that's kind of where we are as a society right now. Like everyone's got my guy, like whether it's in politics with the, you know, political uh, polarization, you know, oh, he's my guy I voted for. I'm like, great. Like if I vote for somebody, I want the media to hold that person accountable and hold their feet to the fire. I don't care that I voted for them. Like if they do something wrong, I want to know so I can vote them out the next time. Uh, but now it's kind of like, well, no, I voted for him. He can't do any wrong. There's nothing, you know, why are you attacking him? Why are you taking this side? Why are you taking the other side? And it's, you know, like people have kind of lost sight of, of truth. And so um, if I feel confident what I have to say and that my opinion has merit, I mean, I, I to be honest with you, I don't even really care what people think. <laughs> Did you ever consider uh, going into news or was sports always your, um, you know, number one goal? I mean, you never thought I can do this. I can be a hard line news reporter. Uh, no, I, I have, and I still do. Um, you know, I think who knows, maybe, maybe the world turns one day and, and gives me that opportunity, but I'm not sure I'd be willing to start over in news. Um, haven't been this far up the ladder in sports, but yeah, there was actually an opportunity a few years ago. Um, it just wasn't, it just wasn't the right time. And, you know, I really like it at ESPN as well. So, um, you know, that's the other thing, you know, when you work for a great company and you work for a lot of great people, uh, you know, you don't necessarily want to leave, but there was um, a potential opportunity about three years ago. It just, um, you know, I just couldn't pull the trigger. Um, because again, like I said, I mean, I, I, I still enjoy sports. I don't know. Um, you know, I got into sports because I think it represents an escape. And I think people need a little fantasy in their lives. People need something that, you know, is real, but not real. And so, uh, yeah, for me, uh, I think sports has kind of always been a passion. And, you know, there are times in news where it would feel like work. Sports has never felt like work. For sure. I kind of wanted to get uh, away from the field a little bit and just kind of asked uh, um, about some other stuff. You know, do you have a favorite Indian food? You know, do you have a favorite Indian movie? I mean, is that uh, – Something you consume you know, often, or? I don't have the patience to sit through a Bollywood movie. Like, <laughs> I, I won't lie. Like, I just can't do three, four hours and multiple plot twists. Like, that is just not my jam. And, I, and I've been that way probably since I was seven or eight years old. And if my parents would watch that, like, oh, turn that off. Like, I, like, I just don't do musicals in general. Like, that's just not. Um, I mean, and I'm struggling with it now because I got a two and a half year old daughter who, <laughs> you know, nonstop loves these Disney musicals. And I'm like, okay, like, can, you know, nothing against Frozen. I know, hey, it's part of the company, like good movie and all. But can we watch something else? And she just loves these, you know, movies and songs. I just have never been, I like music. I've just never been a musical guy. So Bollywood movies have never really done it for me. But you know, like, I, there's a lot of, like, the cross-cultural movies that I like. I mean, Slumdog Millionaire, I love. Um, there was the other movie with Dev Patel, Lion, which I thought was was fantastic. Um, as somebody who grew up in New Jersey as a huge Springsteen fan, I don't know if I've ever connected with a movie the way I connected with Blinded by the Light, which I just thought oh, yeah. was fantastic. I mean, um, in a lot of ways, like, I felt that was kind of my story in, in some ways. And so... Um, 
you know, like I really enjoy those movies. And then food, you know, I mean, we, we probably, you know, like my wife's not Indian, but we probably get Indian food, I would say like, usually like once a week or once every couple of weeks. Um, she loves it. She's even learned to cook some of it. So like, we'll go get, we'll go get doses. We'll go get some Malai Kofta, you know, some good garlic naan, samosa chat, man. Um, anything with paneer, um, I'm good, you know? So, um, yeah, like I, I will, like, if there's a good Indian restaurant when I'm out on the road, I actually found one in, in all places, Provo, Utah. I will go. <laughs> like, even, yeah, like I'll finally, like, I'll go to the lunch buffet. I'm like, I'm going there. So, um, you know, I will look for some good Indian spots when I'm on the road. Uh, you know, at the end, and you obviously are, are nowhere close to this. You've got plenty to go in your career. But at the end of your career, when you retire, and they say in the news, you know, Anish Sharaf was, uh, you know, I think a, a pioneer in sort of um, ushering in Indian Americans, bring diversity to the business. How would you feel about that? I don't know. You know, I mean, I, I, I've um... – I haven't really thought of that much for me, you know, more than anything, it's funny. Somebody asked me this years ago when I was speaking to a class, you know, like, what do you want on your gravestone? Right? Like what, what is your legacy? And I, to me at the end of the day, it's just, Hey, was a, was I a good father? Was I a good husband? Was I a good son? Was I a good friend? Um, I don't really get caught up in defining myself with what I do for a living. Um, I know because you're on TV and you're public, it's easy for everybody else to do that. And they see you that way. I don't get caught up in defining myself that way. Um, to me, you know, being a good dad, being a good husband, um, you know, that stuff uh, <laughs> supersedes everything. So um, at the end of the day, if I was able to open some doors and help some people. Um, I, I will continue to try to do that. But um you know, I, I, I guess I, I don't really care how someone else writes my story. I just want to be comfortable with how I wrote my own story. And, uh, and that's, that's a great point. And my final question for you, uh, since most of my audience is uh, Virginia Tech, I, I would be remiss without asking you about um, your friendships that you have with uh, Bill Roth and John Laser and Andrew Allegretta. Uh, Bill and Andrew, of course, are uh, from your Syracuse family, and you and John intersected on your way up to uh, – Get to get to where you are today. So, what what do those friendships mean to you with those guys? Yeah, Bill. Bill was a guy who I've always just looked up to, and he was one of the guys when I was in college. He would always come back, offer his time and advice and wisdom, and you know, it was kind of like a mentorship in the beginning, and then it kind of grew into a friendship. And, and you know, Bill will tell you, you know, um, my my dog may have bitten off a piece of his hand once, uh, but but we're still friends. <laughs> Um, and I did send him a gift basket. So we, 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 we did try to paper that over, but no, B Bill's always been just a good friend and somebody who, who listens. And, um, you know, I just, I've always respected how he goes about his craft and what he does. And, you know, we're able to talk about a lot of things beyond sports. So he's somebody I've really gotten to know well, you know, probably in the last 10 years or so. And I got to know Andrew through Bill and Andrew and I have become, you know, really good friends. Saw him when I was down in Tulane earlier this year. Um, a guy I think who has an incredibly bright future, but also, you know, I think, I think we get along with those guys because, um, you know, our interests are not just in sports. And the last time I hung out with Andrew, you know, his wife was about to have a kid and we we're talking about family and what it's like being a dad in this business when you have to travel and go on the road. And um, it was kind of cool to just have that kind of conversation about fatherhood. And, and you know, John and I, um, it was funny when, when I worked in Yakima, John was doing the, the Yakima bear short season, a ball. And so, you know, we'd bring him out when we'd have like some of the news people and then throw some parties. And when I'd be out there shooting a the game for TV, he'd be like, Hey man, you want to come do a couple innings? Like he was just bored doing a game by himself. So <laughs> I'd pop in with him if I had time, maybe like call an inning or two with him and we'd have fun. And that's how we got to know each other. And then we reconnected at a VCU game when he was doing VCU and I was doing the game for ESPN and have stayed in touch. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of neat, man. Like all three of those guys um, definitely are special to me and they mean something to me in their own different ways. Um, and uh, you guys are fortunate to have those guys in your orbit. Anish Sharaf, I can't thank you so much for your time. I mean, I just enjoyed our conversation. I mean, you just have so much to say about you know your journey and race and 
um, how we can sort of break through these stereotypes that are present in our society. Again, thank you so much for your time, and I greatly appreciate you taking a few minutes with us. Yeah, I enjoyed this. Stay in touch, Billy. For Anish Sharaf, this I am Billy Parvatam. This has been the latest edition of The Pulse with BP. Thank you so much, guys. We'll see you next time. Thanks, man. I